But I, I don't think uh, there's any way that you can deny that um, economic growth is going to be very challenged going forward because of what's going to happen to population. It is the single biggest issue um, that involves human beings that's going to happen this century that's getting the least amount of conversation. The UN projects that the global population will peak at around 10.4 billion people sometime by the mid-2080s, but our next guest believes it could happen much sooner than that, and the results could be pretty detrimental for our economy. Let's talk about the implications of this and his research. He is Daryl Bricker, global CEO at Ipsos Public Affairs. He was formerly the director of research for the Prime Minister of Canada's office under Brian Maroney from 1989 to 1990. Welcome to the show, Daryl. Good to see you. Thanks for having me on, David. I want to talk about uh, your work on demographics. Uh, you co-authored uh, with John Ibbotson a book called Empty Planet, The Shock of Global Population Decline. And through your research, um, which you've done on population trends, you've discussed how this, like I introduced you in, in the introduction, the trend of global population decline may happen a lot sooner than what the UN is projecting. Tell us what you found. Yeah, a lot sooner and at a lot lower level. I think the, the likelihood that we'll ever get to 10.4 billion people uh, any time this century is very remote. I mean, we just crossed the line of getting to 8 billion people last year. Very unlikely that we're going to get to 9. And I think as time goes on, the UN is going to adjust those predictions. I think we're probably going to peak around somewhere around mid-century, somewhere around 2050, and then it's going to start to decline. And how low it goes, nobody really knows. Okay, well, tell us a bit more about your research and the process um, of arriving at that conclusion. Well, it's uh, if you uh, get a chance to take a look at Empty Planet, we basically traveled around the world and talked to people about um, what was going on in their own family situations and looked very carefully at, uh, uh, at uh, what the implications of what they, uh, they are uh, – in, in their own lives, what they were in the data that we were taking a look at. And, you know, the UN has uh, certainly some data that it, it acquires from, from other countries, but there's also other sources of data when you, when you take a look at it that suggest actually a different, a different picture. And there is a group of uh, demographers, and when John and I were writing at the book at the time, it was a smaller group, it's a growing group, uh, that uh, suggests that uh, maybe we really, really need to rethink uh, what, uh, what the projections are just based on the facts on the ground. So it was a combination of qualitative data from going around and talking to people all over the world, but also looking at uh, alternative data sets and coming up with other projections. The global population has increased more in the last 100 years than all the other centuries of human civilization put well, the together. Well, less, uh, I would say, even faster than that. It's yeah. I mean, uh, since since 1950, it's gone from two and a half billion up to eight billion today. So the the, the question would be obviously, well, why is this going to change? And it's a very right. simple answer: we stopped having kids. That's okay. that, that's the reason. And and uh, I'll just give a Canadian example for for your listeners. But uh, anybody anybody in the developing world, this is pretty similar to what's going on in your country. So the average uh, Canadian woman back in 1960 uh, got married around the age of 21, uh, started to have her family soon after, and had on average four kids, four children. Four was the average. Today, the average Canadian woman gets uh, married, if at all, around the age of 30, has a child so shortly after, and then maybe have a second, but more likely just stops at one. And the average now is 1.3. So our fertility rate has gone from four in 1960 to 1.3 today and continues to decline. We're going to probably see it drop closer to 1.2 next year. And the reason for that, there's all sorts of reasons, but most of it relate to, relates to the decisions that, that families are making about the, 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 the size of the family that they're going to have. Is, have you noticed a correlation or a relationship between rising wealth or standards of living and the declining fertility rate in developed countries? Yeah, the, the, the wealthier countries get, usually what ends up happening is that that has a better job market, usually a job market that requires people to have a higher degree of education to take most advantage of it. Women are uh, participating in, uh, in education at a far higher rate than they used to in the past. And as a result of that, you see a very close correlation between female education and declining fertility. Before we continue with the interview, I want to tell you about a great resource for investors, Doug Casey's Crisis Investing Newsletter. Now, as many of you may know, uh, Doug Casey has been 
a regular guest on my show and is a fan favorite, which is why I'm pleased that he's decided to sponsor this message today. Now, for those of you who may not know Doug, he is a best-selling author of several books, including the New York Times best-selling book, Crisis Investing. And he's had a proven track record at spotting market opportunities, especially in beaten down sectors. Even during distress, there are still opportunities for investors, which is why Doug writes about them in detail in his Crisis Investing newsletter, which covers a wide range of assets. A recent issue of Crisis Investing focused on the uranium market, for example. Uranium was one of the top performing commodities last year and has already breached $100 per pound in January 2024. But Doug believes prices are going much higher. What sets Crisis Investing apart is that Doug recommends stocks that he likes and actually owns personally. This means you get direct insights into his thinking and how this legendary investor is growing and protecting his own wealth. Doug has agreed to give a 20% discount to viewers of the David Lynn Report. So if you'd like to know more about how Doug is investing his money, subscribe to Crisis Investing today. Just go to crisisinvesting.com slash David in the link down below or scan the QR code here. So ultimately, should we be worried about this uh, faster than I guess expected population decline? Does this have any real impacts on the economy and our way of life? Oh, we should, I think we should be very worried about it. I mean, the, uh, the easiest part that people tend to overfocus on is, the, uh, uh, is the, uh, the effect that this is going to have on the labor force. So the ability to find uh, labor going forward to produce all the things that we need in order to keep the economy growing. But I think that, as I said before, that's the easy part. The hard part is consumption. Uh, because not only is the, the population going to get smaller, what's left is going to get a lot older. And older people are usually uh, consumers of health care services, of pensions, but not necessarily consumers of consumer goods. Um, so since the end of the Second World War in particular, most of our economic growth has really been driven by the growth of our population and the consumption needs that are associated with that. When you start going down the other direction, you're going to have a very different circumstance. And that's where uh, you know we're going to have real challenges when it comes to consumption going forward. Yes, there's two trends. People are getting older, they're living longer, life expectancies are increasing. And on the other hand, like you mentioned, fertility rates are going down. How are fiscal policies going to react to this? Well, fiscal policies are going to react to it and the governments are going to be shifting um, where, they, uh, uh, where they spend their money. And you're going to start seeing rapid increases in everything related to health care and particularly long-term care. And then you're going to see a real combat taking place in countries uh, over uh, whether parts of, for example, the defense budget, parts of the, um, parts of the education budget are going to have to be shifted over to meet these needs. You're not alone in sounding the alarm bell. So Elon Musk, for example, in August of 2022, he tweeted – on X, population collapse due to low birth rates is a much bigger risk to civilization than global warming. Is that hyperbole, or would you agree with him? Uh, I, I'm not going to claim that I'm an expert on global warming, so we'll leave sure. that to Mr. Musk. But uh, on, on terms of the, uh, the level of urgency around the issue of population, yeah, I think there needs to be a, a great amount of urgency around it, because quite frankly, we're not prepared for it. I mean, even in our own country, David, there's going to be an explosion by 2030. We're going to have over a million people who are going to have dementia, which is specifically related to the aging of the population. And nobody's prepared to deal with this. Uh, so uh, we need to get a conversation going about what the future is going to look like, the real future is going to look like. And it's a, it's a future in which populations are going to be challenged to grow. Uh, really only going to be growing as a result of immigration. And uh, the, what remains of that population is going to be much older and have all of those uh, issues that you need to deal with relative to an aging population, which are basically, when it comes to things like public services related to health care. Let's talk about immigration. That is the key. So how is immigration going to help a country like Canada if the entire global population as an aggregate trend is going down? Yeah, there's, uh, you know, uh, there's movements in our, in our country that talk about, you know, maybe getting to 100 million people in Canada. It's never going to happen unless we completely knock down the, all, of the, uh, all of the parameters that we put and controls that we put around, uh, that we put around um, uh, uh, immigration. Uh, but uh, uh, the truth is the places that we're bringing our immigrants from are all going through very similar kinds of uh, situations uh, in, which their, um, in which their fertility rates are declining. China is probably down close to one now, 
the largest population in the world, China, 1.4 billion, no longer the largest population. India passed them last year. Uh, they're going to lose half their population this, uh, over the space of the next uh, over the space of the next 70 years. So we're not going to be getting immigrants from China because they're just it's a young person's game, and there's not going to be very many young Chinese people to send to Canada. It's the same thing in India. India, uh, over the space of the last two years, has also declined to a, a fertility rate that's below replacement rate. And people have a hard time accepting that this, but this is what the Indian government is telling us. In countries like Japan, it's projected that their dependency ratio will reach one to one, meaning for every working person, there will be a non-working person either below the age of 15 or over the age of 64. What does this mean for economic growth? Well, it means that economic growth is going to be very challenged. Uh, as I mentioned before, if our economy is driven by consumption um, and growth is driven by consumption, when you have uh, a uh, fewer people consuming when the population shrinks. But not only that, an older population, which is uh, actually a non-consumptive population, they're not out buying new cars. They're not buying, uh, you know, buying new houses to, to expand their families. They're not, uh, they're not, uh, you know, buying new baby clothes. They're not buying cribs. They're not buying uh, all the things that are associated with glow, uh, growing families. Uh, and they're basically sitting on their money, uh, we're going to have to come up with another way that our economy can grow. And it's probably trying to find a way to unlock that and to and find a way to get them back into being consumers. Do you think long-term um, population decline is inflationary or deflationary? Well, there, I've, I've heard both uh, arguments. I mean, there's some pretty good arguments about it actually being inflationary. Um, and, and really because of the result of expanded need for government spending and public services. But then I've also heard deflationary arguments that are related to declining consumption. So I, I think the economists have to sort that one out. I could think that there's a pretty good case that you could probably make for elements of both of those things happening. But I, I don't think uh, there's any way that you can deny that um, economic growth is going to be very challenged going forward because of what's going to happen to population. It is the single biggest issue um, that involves human beings that's going to happen this century that's getting the least amount of conversation. Governments are starting to pick up on this. Um, the Wall Street Journal released an article on 13th of May. I'll just read a paragraph from this article. So in high-income nations, fertility fell below replacement in the 1970s and took a leg down during the pandemic. Um, it's dropping in, develop in developing countries too, like India surpassed China, as the most populous country last year. Many government leaders see this as a matter of national urgency. They worry about shrinking workforces, slowing economic growth, and underfunded pensions, and the vitality of a society with ever fewer children. So my question is, now that we're starting to have this conversation in the public sphere, now that I guess hopefully more people will be aware of this, what is the government going to do about it? Well, they're trying everything, depending on the country that you can go to. There was a great piece in The Economist this week about, uh, about all of the different policies the governments are putting in place. I mean, everything from uh, you know, uh, uh, reducing taxes for people who have children to giving them uh, you know, super baby bonuses to have kids, to reduce uh, things like making child care free. The problem is none of these things actually seem to work. And the reason is because they're focused on the wrong problem. Uh, the problem they're focused on is basically market failure. Uh, the idea is that if you could put the right incentives in place, then the, the market for having children would improve. So the, the focuses are, uh, you know, uh, incentives to reduce the cost of having children, and for particularly women in the workplace, reducing um, the uh, the motherhood penalty that they suffer in terms of careers. But the, the the real issue that we're dealing with in this with this, David, is that that's not why people aren't having kids. The reason people are have, not wanting to have kids is they just don't want them. They don't really feel that their life will be enhanced by having larger families. Uh, if they do have kids, one is enough, maybe two, if, uh, you know, on the outside. Uh, and, and as a result of that, what we're going through is this massive cultural change that says that, you know, participating in creating the next generation isn't really the priority of this generation. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what was the impetus behind this decade-long cultural shift? I mean, I can probably off the top of my head name a few. The biggest change was uh, women's uh, labor participation rate has increased dramatically over the last couple of set, uh, decades. Uh, but beyond that, I, you know, I'll you defer to you. Well, uh, they, well it, it kind of goes in a pattern. So the, the first thing that happened is urbanization. So everybody thinks that, uh, I'm not sure, I shouldn't say everybody, because there's probably people listening to this podcast who don't think this, 
that, you know, the huge migration that we're going through in the world today is people moving from one country to another. The truth is that only about 4% of the global population doesn't live in the country in, was, in which it was born. But we are going through a huge migration, and that's people moving from rural and smaller town communities to urban and suburban communities. And when people move from a rural uh, and an agricultural subsistence type of life to an urban type of life that's based on a capitalist, uh, uh, regular wage earning type of an economy, um, what happens is they change their calculations about having families. So in, on the farm, lots of kids, lots of free labor. In the city, lots of kids that really don't make an economic contribution. They're actually an expense to a family. So we make a rational economic decision. But apart from that, also the lives of women change. So they're no longer influenced as much by their grandmothers, their clan, uh, you know, their, their, their mothers, their aunts and their uncles um, in, in terms of the life choices that they want to make. They see different role models when they move to the city and their ability to have more of an independent life in which they can make more of their, deci more of their decisions in independently if they have their own money and their own financial control leads them to get educations which takes them out of having children as soon as they used to have them and leads them into the economy, in, in the formal economy, which also leads to a bit of a delay. So people wait until the right time to have kids. And when they wait for that right time, usually around 30 or, or a little after that, it's also a time in which it's very difficult to have kids because their biological capability declines. So you're saying there's little the government can do to incentivize a reversal of this cultural shift? Everything that they've discovered so far is around the edges. I mean, uh, you can spend a ton of money like they do in, for example, the Nordic countries, and all of them have below replacement re uh, fertility rates and declining. Tax breaks, for example, wouldn't that, wouldn't that work? Uh, well, you know, if you, have, uh, if you look at Hungary, which has taken an incredibly strong approach towards this, um, and they have big tax breaks, you know, uh, people in certain age categories, you know, if, if you have, have your first kid below a certain age, uh, they will uh, basically exempt you for taxes for life. No impact. And the reason is, uh, there's slight impacts, but not enough to get them above replacement rate. And the reason is because people just do not feel the need to uh, live a life that has a, a, a family of more than two associated with it. Let me present to you another scenario to evaluate, please. So sure. suppose we just accept this trend. Don't try to change it, just accept it, but invest in having AI and robots replace the deficit in the workforce. In other words, we just have more resources, more productivity, perhaps even a better lifestyle because everything that used to be produced by humans now can be produced by robots. Yeah, I've heard that utopia before, but the problem is robots don't buy new cars. Robots don't have, uh, don't have investments. Ro ro robots don't uh, you know, go to restaurants. Uh, robots can, and that's why I said the, the low hanging fruit on this is everything that's related to production. The hard one is the one that's related to consumption. We're going to have to change our tax re regimes probably in some fairly extreme ways to capture value out of that production in some other, some other way and not necessarily rely on people's consumptions or even their incomes to, 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 to create uh, what our tax base is going to be. It's going to be increasingly challenged. We're going to have, uh, you know, most of the population growth in the world these days takes place as a result of people not dying as fast as they used to, not no new people coming into that population. So even getting closer to 9 billion people, it's not going to be because people are having more kids. It's going to be because people aren't dying as fast as they once were. Why is sub-Saharan Africa's uh, replacement rate still higher than the rest of the world? High infant mortality. So okay. they have higher okay. infant mortality rates than, uh, than the, uh, the rest of the world. So actually, if, even if you take a look at India, which has a relatively high uh, for, uh, infant mortality rate relative to, say, for example, the United States or Canada, um, the actual replacement rate for India is probably 2.3, 2.4, 2.5. And they're, they're at two right now, and that's because infant mortality remains higher. So in Africa, uh, um, people don't live as long as they do in the rest of the world. I mean, Go to a place like Nigeria, the, uh, the expected right. age of longevity is 55, whereas in Canada, it's 82. Let's assume that the living standards of these African nations improve. Would you expect the replacement rate of, uh, of birth to also change? Yeah. Uh, so you would expect, just like we've seen in every other place in the world, and you don't have to guess about this because we all follow the same pattern, uh, that you would see infant mentality uh, continue to decline. But, uh, and, you know, there are people who argue that there's going to be a huge demographic advantage for Africa going through the century. And to which my answer would be, well, if they can answer their 
um, you know, the cultural issues that they're dealing with in terms of the ability to do business there, the legal issues that they're dealing with, and also the educational issues that they'd be dealing with in order to be able to make that, 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 uh, that uh, surplus population actually economically productive, uh, the political circumstances that exist there, then yeah, maybe. But uh, there's a pretty long gap, a pretty wide gap between what's ideal in order to be able to take advantage of a demographic uh, a bonus compared to what they have in existence right now. Could you think of any, I guess, advantages of a population decline that could outweigh the cons that we've talked about? Perhaps, just you know, perhaps, uh, you know, it, it might be beneficial to have a lower population density in some urban areas. Perhaps we might get lower pollution, so on and so forth. Actually, urban areas generally have a lower carbon footprint than rural areas. Interestingly enough, um, and where, where they're habitated by humans, and that's because. Uh, people who live in denser areas tend to travel in different ways. There's a lot of, you know, heat. Uh, um, for example, in, in North American cities, there's a colder cities. There's a lot of heat advantage for people living in closer areas. And uh, so, the, one of the, uh, the the larger cities tend to have a, a fairly low uh, carbon footprint in comparison to smaller places. Uh, they, they tend to have a larger uh, carbon footprint. But um, the um, uh, the, uh, anything that has to do with the environment is probably going to benefit from this. There's no doubt. If, if you believe, as I do, that uh, human beings' activities contribute to things like climate change and other types of environmental degradation, then fewer of them um, is probably going to be good. But everything that has to do with the economy is going to be a real challenge. In your research, have you looked at perhaps a hypothetical floor for the population of the world? In other words, a, a level that can't be, you know... Can't go any lower? Well, you know, there are these hypothetical models that you do see out there where people say that we reach a natural replacement rate all around the world and then we kind of motor on tickety-boo at around, you know, 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion. You can, just, you can pick your number. But uh, the truth in all of these models is that they're all a bit ridiculous because no country seems to be stopping at the 2.1 floor. Once they start to decline, they just continue to decline. And the other part is that uh, what happens is that um, uh, that uh, the population continues to age, and most of your growth comes from that. So, essentially, what we're doing in many countries is is flipping their population pyramids from, you know, the ones that look like this: lots of kids, few people at the top, few older people at the top. They're now flipping, so it's few kids at the bottom and lots of older people at the top. So that that you know these uh, uh, hypothetical models that suggest that there's this perfect place that we're going to be, don't really add up to where the numbers are going. How would this possibly impact asset prices, commodities, for example, if we're moving away from a less con from a consumerist economy to, to less consumption in the future? We're talking about real estate, base metals, agricultural products. How would these assets be affected, do you think? I think uh, all of them that involve uh, growing populations to lead to, their, uh, uh, to, to growth in their usage are all going to be challenged. I don't think that there's any doubt about that. I think uh, anything that is re relying on consumer usage um, is, is going to be an issue. I think companies that, for example, are in the business of uh, like uh, pharmaceuticals, given the aging of the population, th that's going to be interesting. Uh, leisure companies that are in, 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 uh, selling products, particularly to seniors or anybody selling products that are um, over-indexed among people who are older, um, they're going to be in a, in a better position. But anybody who's focused on selling things to younger people, and I tell this to our clients all the time, I mean, you need to have an expanded vision of what the market is. It's no longer just about trying to sell to Gen Z and hoping that they're going to be your loyal customer for, for the rest of their lives. Because the first thing we know is that there is no such thing as customer loyalty, not the way that it used to exist. And by the way, that group is smaller than you think, and it has less money than you think. How is, um, how is this global demographic shift going to affect politics and political leanings, left or right? This is going to be one of the biggest political issues, uh, issues that this is going to be one of the most important issues that we're going to adjudicate through the political process over the course of this century. Um, uh, when you uh, uh, when you start talking about shrinking and declining populations and all of the pressures that this creates, there's obviously going to be generational um, effects on that. But then there's also going to be people who are going to view this in different ways. So, for example, you have degrowth people who are out there, usually on the very strongly progressive left, where they'll say, this is all great. And then you'll have a group of people who are in the center, uh, like the kind of liberal, technocratic, bureaucratic uh, 
uh, centrists who will say, no, it's all about these incentives that we have to put in place in order to get people to have more kids. And as we discussed before, good luck with that. Doesn't seem to be working anywhere. And then you've got another people who's going to be the stronger right on this, who is a combination or a combination of people who are more religious and traditional. And they'll say, we should just go back to the way things were. Uh, and we'll have larger families like we once did. Uh, but women are going to have, a, in particular, going to have a hard time adjusting their lives to that and are going to resist it. But then you also have the, the group that you mentioned uh, when you mentioned Mr. Musk, which is people who look at this as a, uh, also a technological challenge. And they see that the world uh, with a declining population, particularly as AI continues to expand and machines become, I don't want to use the word sentient, but they become more of a part of the decision making in our lives, that all of a sudden there might be the pressure for technology to displace human beings and they're worried about that. And also they bring into this idea that you know maybe there are other ways of producing human beings outside of the normal process that we use, outside of the human body that maybe we should be considering. So you can see all of this as political minefields. What is your ultimate solution? We haven't talked about what you think should be done to avert a crisis. I, I don't think that there is an ultimate solution. I think that we've got to be experimenting with all of these things. But what I would implore anybody who's interested in this topic to do is to start talking about it, to understand that this is not like, uh, you know, Paul Ehrlich's, uh, you know, population bomb, some hypothetical vision of the future, or this isn't some sort of brave new world kind of analysis that's, you know, uh, uh, science fiction and I'm describing a world that's not going to exist. The thing about demography, these demographic changes, is most of the decisions about what our future demography is going to be have already been made. They were made by your grandparents and they were made by your parents and they're now being made by you. We're just going to have to live through them and they're entirely predictable and projectable. We can mark them on the calendar. By the year 2030, for example, we know the entire global baby boom is going to be of retirement age, 65. We already know that. But who's preparing for that? Are you not somewhat relieved to know that there's not going to be, I guess, um, not enough resources for everybody in the world? We're going to have complete over. I, I remember when I was in school, you know, oh, yeah, it's all, it's all overpopulation was the risk. Now it's the opposite. Yeah, well, Malthus talked about this back at the, you know, the, the, the turn of the, uh, the turn of the between the 18th and the 19th century. And, you know, he was wrong then. And the, Malth the neo Malthusians, and there's a lot of them, are wrong now. Uh, let's finish off with, uh, I guess, your current work. I mean, you've worked in the public polling sector for decades. You were a founding president of the Canadian Association for Public Opinion Research. Um, over the many decades of you being in the space, have you noticed interesting tre uh, trends and shifts in public perception or opinion that are you know interesting oh, to yeah. note? I mean, I mean uh, you know, if you think back to when our country, and I'll just take Canada as an example, was founded, uh, and, and well, actually, just even looking back to when our our, con our constitution was was repatriated from from the UK uh, back in 1980-81. Uh, uh, you know, the number one immigrant group to Canada at that time uh, was people from the United Kingdom. And it wasn't until the mid 1980s. Now the number one immigrant by by far. You can almost add up all the other groups that are coming to Canada, and just one group is way would constitute almost that entire group is people from India. I mean, it's completely changed. I wrote another book called with John Ibbotson called The Big Shift. And it's about the fact that Canada is moving from being a Atlantic oriented, basically French and English country made up of people who are white, um, except for the indigenous population, uh, to becoming a country that's more Pacific oriented in which the car commuting suburbs are the engines of, of growth. It's where people are moving and it's becoming brown. Uh, it's a completely different country than, than existed before. It's grown quite rapidly. We're still one of the most rapidly, I think, uh, almost 3% population growth, which is way above the, the average for the G7 and, and, the, and the G20. So our population continues to grow, but it's going to be challenging our countries and our institutions in ways that we, country and institutions in way that, ways that nobody ever previously anticipated. So yeah, you want to notice big trends? That's a big trend. Yeah, and, and this new group of immigrants, how... What do they want for the country? In other words, how are they going to affect public policy? Let's take Canada, for example. Uh, the answer is they don't know. And in, in, in the majority population that is in the country today, they don't know either. We're, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge social experiment that we're all going to be going through together. Um, and uh, it, I think it's going to test our tolerance. Um, 
that previously, you know, people who were opposed to increasing immigration were mostly opposed because they didn't like the cultural changes that it caused. We're in an environment right now where increased immigration has even made people who are not you know, anti-immigrant or if more strongly put more racist resist uh, um, uh, immigration, mainly because of the effect that it's had on the cost of housing and, uh, and, and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the effect that that's had on people's ability to realize their middle class dream. So even reasonable people can have trouble with immigration now, which is a new thing in Canada. Well, there, should there be changes in immigration laws such that we can protect housing uh increases maybe just change housing laws or who can own well, we're already seeing it you're already seeing it happen as the government's now restricting student visas to a certain extent uh, i think that we're going to see that the numbers of immigrants are going to uh, uh, be assessed the the sources of immigration uh, i don't think are necessarily going to be as uh challenged the way that they were historically but i do think the uh the uh the educational levels, the ability for people to, to fit into the country, I think are going to become a stronger part of what people look for. But remember, David, all of this is happening at the same time as our birth rate is collapsing, and we do need more younger people to support the older population that we have. Well, do you think Canada should adopt a visa system like the U.S. where a more stringent one based on uh, exactly who or what employers are sponsoring you to work, or if you're an exceptional, deemed exceptional by the state, you can apply for O one that kind of thing? Well, I th they, we do do some of that in Canada, but I think you're going to see those issues raised a lot more, yeah. Okay. Great, Daryl. Thank you very much for your time today. Where can we learn more about your work? Um, I mentioned you have a book. Where else? Yeah, I've, I've written about seven, actually. So you can find them all on find them all on Amazon. The two latest that you might be interested in, we talked about Empty Planet, but I also wrote another book about Canada called Next, in which I look at uh, I look at uh, – a number of the issues that we've been talking about just strictly in a Canadian context and more particularly oriented towards a business audience rather than a political or, or social audience. So uh, people might be interested in taking a look at that. And as I said before, you can find them on Amazon. And everywhere that you watch uh, and consume or listen to news, you'll see Ipsos popping up as a, a, in terms of the work that we put out there on relative to public opinion. Our polling partner is Global News. And we always have lots of polls that we're putting out on politics and uh, you know, economic and social life in Canada. So please take a look at that. And of course, always go to Ipsos.com. You can o not only just find, find data about what's going on in Canada, but you can find out all about all our polls all over the world. And we're active in 90 countries. I've got one final question before um, sure. I go. And this is something that I think a lot of Canadians are wondering, but why is our voter turnout so low compared to the other G7 countries? Well, actually, it's gone up. I mean, so it, it, Stephen Harper got elected with a majority of 59% turnout. Justin Trudeau, I think turnout was around 67. So it depends on the election. So if people feel that there's a lot at stake in the election, and particularly if they feel it's going to be a change election, then voter turnout goes up. So the biggest reason is whether or not people are actually motivated to show up based on the issues and uh, the consequences of the election rather than the actual electoral process itself. I ha I, I'd love to get you back on and talk more about uh, the current state of uh, the Canadian economy in more detail next time. But uh, that was a very good talk. Thank you very much, Daryl. Appreciate it. Anytime, David. Thanks for having me on. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.